Well, good day, church, and happy new year. My name is Dennis Sanders, and I am the pastor of First Christian Church of St. Paul. And uh, this is the weekly check-in. So, I don't know about you, but um, while we were all getting ready for Christmas, um, there was this clip that made its way around social media. And I'm pretty sure you saw it. It shows a young man, and he bearded young man he's playing the drums nothing spectacular about that but he's doing it while he's suspended in the air maybe about 10 15 20 feet in the air and there are other young men that are also drummers as well this is all part of a rehearsal this is part of a rehearsal for a christmas celebration at prestonwood baptist church in plano texas outside of dallas this was a, a Christmas program that is called the Gift of Christmas. It's a, it was an event um, that is definitely not your put your kids in a bathrobe Christmas pageant. This was serious business. A press release from the congregation basically is describing this production and it puts Cecil B. DeMille to shame. It talks about the fact that it is a visually stunning multimedia event. It includes a large cast special effects, an LED video wall, and a 50-piece orchestra playing an original score. So it should come as no surprise that there were complaints. The most common complaints was that the money that, could, that was being used and spent on this production um, could have been used to help the poor. Now that's not a I actually think that there is a lot of legitimacy to that complaint. But really what fascinates me about this was not that. It was how this was an example of the extent that churches will go in this age that we live in to try to get people's attention, especially when there are so many different things competing for our ever shrinking attention spans. We live in an age in 2023 in what the Canadian sociologist Charles Taylor calls the imminent frame. Now imminent means something that is in front of us, the things that we can see. Now the difference of course is that the God that we worship is one that is transcendent, something that we can't see. And so, but we live in this age where we place so much value on the imminent. And it is hard for a religious person, of any religion actually, to live in this imminent age, partially because we are also part of it as well. And so, Churches when, and other places of, of faith living in this, the temptation here is to be relevant, to be hip, to be with it. And so we try to be relevant in various different ways. It could mean that we are this type of church that is on the vanguard of all of these social issues, whether it's things dealing with immigration, or it's dealing with transgender issues. It might mean that we have like the world's greatest worship experience. Or it could also mean flying drummers. Now, First Christian is not getting any flying drummers anytime soon. But the temptation is there. It doesn't matter what size your congregation is, we're all feeling this temptation that we have to have some kind of a hook that's going to draw people in. And we're so worried about decline and how people just don't seem interested in, in church anymore. And sometimes churches will spend an inordinate amount of resources to try to be relevant. Or maybe they realize they don't have those resources when they just give up and close. Andrew Escada, who is a Presbyterian pastor in Atlanta, wrote a book review. And I'll share what the book is in a little bit. But 
he wrote this and he spells out what all of this means to, to live in this age and to try to be relevant. What does it mean? And this is what he writes, quote, what does it mean, however, for those of us in the practice of ministry, where we have been taught that there are ways of doing ministry that work, and we too find ourselves in the rat race of church survival? I think it means this, in the context of the eminent frame, declining church attendance and a cultural rejection of the transcendent, our methods of ministry will not save us and we must stop thinking that they will. The move from method to method, from this context to that one, is at core an attempt at relevance and we can be assured that these attempts at relevance will require the church itself to be the main character of its story. Now, he was reviewing a book by the theologian Andrew Root, who is a, th um, th a professor at Luther Seminary in St. Paul. And he wrote a book that I'm, unfortunately, I'm slowly reading, I'm not a fast reader, that is called Churches and the Crisis of Decline. If you have a chance, I would consider picking up a copy. It's a prescient bu book for us here at First Christian, and on any church, I think, that is dealing with these questions about relevance and decline. One of the things that he does is he, he fleshes out his ideas in an allegory. He uses a church, a fictional church called St. John the Baptist, and how its members are dealing with this sense of decline. And one day, the grandson, the adult grandson of a beloved member who recently died, comes to the Bible study. And he asks how he can find God. And this sends the church on a journey. They are sent on a journey with this young man, and in turn, they are found by God, just as in time, this young man is found by God. It was through this relationship with the young man, and through the normal parts of church life, like preaching and prayer and Bible study, they realized and found God had found them, and they realized and had, again, a sense of mission and a sense of purpose. I think that we are called as a church to live our lives faithfully by doing sometimes what may be the most mundane things, going to worship, praying, Bible study, serving others, because it's in those activities that we learn and see where God is active in each other's lives and where we are found by God. The funny thing is, if we read the Gospels, that's basically what Jesus did. Jesus spent time engaging with people, having relationships with people. And it is in those relationships where the people found and were able to see the God who was God now, Jesus did perform miracles, but it's interesting that even in one of the Gospels, miracles are considered, are, are actually considered signs. They point to God. They aren't the thing that people look to in and above themselves. About a year ago, Rob Hamilton, who is a pastor connected with First Christian, basically challenged our congregation to do something. Um, in a sermon. He has a daily practice. It's called the daily examine. And this is an old Jesuit practice where you kind of look back at the day and see where God was present. And he was asking us to do the, that same thing, maybe in a, in a way of journaling, writing down when God was present. I have no idea if anyone at the congregation took up his advice. And I will admit that I haven't always been faithful in doing it. But that whole thing stuck with me because I think that there is something about being open to seeing where God is present in our lives and in our world. Not trying to be relevant, but to have resonance. And we do that by being in relationship. We do that by really even thinking a lot about our own life and where have we seen God in our 
daily connections. None of that will pack people in. But I think it will get us out of ourselves and into God's story because as a church, that's what we're all about is telling God's story. And it also can get us into each other's stories and stories of those people who are outside of the church. Again, none of this is gonna necessarily pack it in like a drummer, a flying drummer. But I think that it could help First Christian and all other, all congregations be more in tune with God and ultimately with God's world. And it might also save us a bit on liability insurance. Take care, church. Godspeed, and I'll see you soon.